Are you ready? Stand by. Welcome to Three Gun Show, brought to you by Armalite Rifles, Breda USA, and LAG Tactical. I'm your host, Dave Hartman. My guest this week is Michigan shooter, engineer, and match director, Matt Kupika. If you're new here, the Three Gun Show is a weekly podcast that is all about practical shooting. I shot my first three gun match in 2011 and completely fell in love with it. Since then, I've shot USPSA, practical shotgun, two gun, and PCC matches. I have rimfire and precision matches on uh, the schedule for 2018, and as always, I generally come back to 3-Gun, as it is the the sport that I'm passionate about. The 3-Gun Show is my way of giving back and introducing new people to the sport. There are over 180 hours of interviews with top competitors across a multitude of disciplines. Each week, we discover topics such as gear, technique, training, mental game, and we joke around and laugh along the way as well especially when we discover match travel stories. If you like this type of podcast, make sure to subscribe in iTunes and leave us a review. This podcast is brought to you by Breda USA, Italian shotguns that are the best in the world. And this is a shotgun tech tip from Team Breda. Hey, this is Dave Harmon from The Three Gun Show, and I'm with Tina Martin-Nims from Team Breda, and we are going to learn about choke selection. So before you go out to the match, you want to make sure that you have an understanding of how... Um, what your chokes are patterned at. So what I like to do is I take, I have my three main chokes that I usually use, which is a spreader, an IC, an improved concylinder, or, and a mod. And I set my targets out at 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30. And it's just like a knockover steel and a flipper. And I test to see what those cho- how they perform at those distances with the ammo that I typically use. And so when I go out onto a stage, I already know that at say 35 yards, I can use my mod choke and knock it out and I'll be all right, ready to go. Awesome, all right, well that's your tech tip from Tina martin Nims of Team Breda. Check out Breda's B12i three gun ready inertia driven shotgun at bredausa.com. That's B-R-E-D-A. This podcast is also brought to you by Armalite. Through Armalite, I am able to get special pricing for listeners on their line of three-gun rifles. They have a 13.5 and an 18-inch model, both with Armalite's patented tunable comp, Timney triggers, Luth AR stocks, and they're ready to go right out of the box. If you're more of a build-your-own-rifle kind of person, I have a few of their competition handguards left in 12-inch and 15-inch sizes as well. So when you're in the market for a rifle or components to build your own, just email me, dave at 3 and I'll hook you up. Anytime you see me on the range, you can check out my rifle. I'm currently rocking the 13.5 inch shorty 3-gun rifle with a Vortex Optics Viper PST 1-6 on it, which I'm really enjoying. In this week's podcast, Matt Kupika and I discuss the absolute basics of 3-gun, from selecting gear to knowing the rules and how to be safe. And finally, what to expect from your first club match. Matt has mentored hundreds of students into the sport at his home club in Michigan, and he's shot major matches all over the country, so he brings with him a wealth of experience. So enjoy this one with Matt Kupika. Matt, welcome back to the Three Gun Show. Hey, Dave. How are you doing? Thanks for having me back. Uh, you know, I'm doing awesome, man. It's uh, it's great to have you on. It's It's been a while. It's been a while since we've uh, chatted here. I was just looking at Skype, and it was like November of 2015 that you were last on the show. Yeah, it's been quite a while. I've made a lot of uh, changes since then. You have? Like what? Oh, yeah. Just, uh, I mean, just my practice regimen and stuff has gotten a little bit more intense. I mean, right now it's kind of backed off. And then I've been doing better at, like, the uh, the major matches and things around the area. Yeah, definitely. I got to shoot with uh, with you and, and uh, your buddy uh, Molina, Nick Molina, at um, Generation 3 Gun. And uh, we had a good time. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I try to stay busy. I don't really get to talk to people a lot during the uh, the match. I talk a lot after the match because right. I'm so busy just trying to reset targets and everything, you know, so. Right. Now, uh, is that like a, an idiosyncrasy of yours, like keep moving, or do you just kind of like try to stay in the zone for sh- uh, shooting sake or what? Oh, I just try to stay pumped and on it, you know. Everyone's trying to get through the stages, so I'm always like the first guy like sprinting out to the, f- the furthest 
plate you could possibly set and running <laughs> through the woods and whatever else. I kind of get like a runner's high after a while of being out day, out all day in the match. And I can just like feel like I can run for 100 miles, you know. Huh. I usually get tired of matches. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> so, Matt, one of the uh, one of the um, biggest pieces of feedback that I got from uh, from people on the last episode that you were on which uh, I'll put a link to in the show notes for people to check that out if they want to hear that first one, was that um, you talked about your practice regimen, and uh, that helped a lot of people decide what they want to do as far as their own regimen. So how has that changed, and what are you, what are you up to now? Um, it's pretty much the same. I do a lot of dry fire and then uh, correlation with my dry fire to my live fire practice. And uh, I think now I'm more in a state where I'm working on like mental type things when it comes to practice rather than the physical aspects or physical transitions and everything like that, it's, it comes down more to like mental type stuff. So in the future, I mean, when I work with people and I teach new people, I'm kind of working more on like the mental side of the game than I am like the physical part, except for maybe movement. I focus a lot on like movement when it comes to physicals, but. Okay. Well, and we're going to be talking uh, about a, a topic that, you know, I don't know, three years into the three gun show, I probably should have covered with a uh like a, a capstone episode especially earlier on but uh we're going to be talking about like an intro to three gun so is uh is part of the mental game is the mental game part of that uh intro there or should we cover it now um it's kind of part of it i mean getting started in three gun is mental to begin with just because uh like i know that when i started competitive shooting i didn't know anybody that was into the sport um, I didn't know that anybody that was in the sport previously so i kind of had nowhere to go i kind of just look online and see what the rules are and uh, a lot of people talk about there being like a, a barrier for gear. Like you don't have the gear, so you can't shoot. Mm -hmm. My barrier is more of a mental barrier. Like I didn't know where to go. I didn't know who to talk to. I didn't know what to do to not look like an idiot when I was there. Yeah. And uh, really none of that really mattered too much. Once I got to my first one and I got through the uh, got through like the etiquette and knowing how, how you're supposed to present yourself and where you're supposed to go, it was, it was no big deal from there. So uh, people that are first starting out, just getting them to come to like my class that I host for, for a three gun is uh, hard enough on its own just because people want to back out because it's just something that they don't want to do. It's kind of like public speaking. You're yeah. like in the eye of all this for a small period of time. And uh, it just kind of gets to people. And it's hard for them to get over that first mental block of just getting there and shooting the match. And once you're there, you realize that nobody really cares how you're shooting. Nobody really cares how bad or good you're doing. They, uh, It's just kind of like a camaraderie. Everybody has a good time and everyone's trying to learn new things and become a better shooter themselves. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. One of my uh, one of my best friends says uh, he has a a saying in reference to concealed carry, but it works for a lot of different things in life. And that saying is, uh, unless you're a hot chick or on fire, no one is paying attention to you. Correct. Yeah, I'd say that 100. <laughs> percent You have the. I've had some like amazing runs, and I'm like, hey, did you see this part? And my my best friends that I travel with would be like, oh no, we weren't paying attention. We're over here like talking about what we're gonna have for lunch or whatever, you know. I know. I know. Like, uh, I, I, I think I asked you like, uh, two or three times at generation three gun, like you up yet? You're like, I just shot like, uh, oh, oh, I meant, oh, yeah. I, meant I meant to Thanks watch lot, you, man. but, uh, <laughs> hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. The, uh, the barrier to, uh, to entry in that mental barrier, I think is a huge thing. Um, you know, I, I've mentioned before on the podcast that when I started shooting three gun that I just went to a three gun match. Uh, but I always forget that I tried to shoot a pistol match probably like two years before that. And, yeah. uh, I called up the, uh, the dude that was running the match and this was, uh, at a, like a really small club that was associated with the place I used to work. And the guy was a total jerk. And, uh, so I never, really? yeah. So I never went to that match. And, uh, and then like two years later is when I went to the first three gun match. So I missed out on like two years of enjoyment, two years of, uh, learning two years of skill development because uh, because some dude was a jerk to me and and that added to like the mental hurdle because at that point I wasn't confident in my skills enough to say well screw that guy I'm gonna go out there anyway. Yeah, I think a lot of people that are new one of the things one of those barriers is that they don't think they're good enough to start and uh, yeah. myself and a couple other people Nick and Chip Montgomery we run like we run the biggest multi gun match in Michigan and it's one of the bigger ones in the area and uh, I mean we'll have people every match. The monthly match, we, we limit it to 100 people, and every monthly match, there's like two or three people there that are brand new that have never shot anything, and they, they get through the match fine. So a lot of people that shoot the smaller matches around our area, they won't come to our match because they're intimidated by it. Like, they think they got to build up a skill set, but then at that same match, there'll be people that have never shot a uh, competitive shooting event in their entire lives, and they do just fine. 
Yeah. I I had those exact same mental blocks, Matt. Like there was a, like I mentioned, this was a um, a small club that was associated with, with uh, where I used to work. So there was probably only like six or seven dudes that would come out and shoot uh, multi-gun. Um, and, you know, I got confident in that arena. But when, when it came to like a friend saying, oh, let's go over to this uh, other club match at this other range, I, I would say like, you know, I'm not ready for that yet. You know? So, yeah. so how do you get over that mental block? And if, you know, if someone's, you know, listening to this and they haven't shot their first mat- match yet, what kind of uh, advice can you give them on, on getting over that mental hump to actually get out to a match? I mean, really, you just, you just got to get out there and do it. You find one of your, that's local in your area. Usually you can use the internet. Um, a lot of times now with like Facebook and everything being so popular, you can get on there and easily find someone that shoots that event, or you might be able to find a page for that event and kind of talk to some of the people there. And uh, you might be able to find out some information. Like I remember using like Google Maps so I could figure out where to park, you know, when I went to my first event. Yeah. And uh, usually if there's someone in the area, like for me in Michigan, it's real easy for people to contact me like personally through Facebook or like Instagram or anything like that. And they can, I can ask, I can answer their questions directly. And then usually I can like meet them somewhere. I can tell them where to park when they drive in. I can meet them there and kind of like pull them in and give them a quick rundown before their first match or squad up with them at that match. But uh, really, if you could find anybody in your area that you kind of know or somewhat know through like Facebook, or if you can find someone that's related to one of those Facebook groups, that's probably one of the easier ways to do it. Yeah. And so you, uh, you and Chip and Nick run the, uh, run the match. So it's probably pretty easy to, to pick like one of the three of you guys to reach out to and say, Hey, I'm a new guy. What do I need to do? What do I need to bring? Where do I need to go? That yeah, kind of thing. You, yeah. There's, there's plenty of times where I've met people up at, at matches that aren't my own, you know, like a, a different local match. I'll meet somebody there and I'll be like, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go over here to sign in. We're going to go over here to register. We're going to squad up, you know, we're going to move our gear to this area. And, uh, I've done that at different matches that are not my own. Like if, and if people aren't from the, uh, the area, the Michigan area or the Detroit area, they can contact me on Facebook and I can answer questions there as well. It's no problem. I do that all the time. Yeah. And, and, uh, I've found that most match directors are, are super, uh, you know, other than the first one, uh, interaction that I had (laughs) are super welcoming to, uh, to new people. And they actually, you know, make a concerted effort to, you know, let everyone know that, Hey, new people are welcome here. Let's, uh, you know, let's, let's all get this person through this match. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's odd that you found a match director that wasn't of that mindset because I've never really met anybody that was, but everyone wants their own match to be successful. And they, I mean, really, we almost always, all of us run these things for, for free. It's like, you know, we're just doing them as a volunteer. So we want people to come in there and have a good time. I'm not making any money off of it. So the more people I can get in at it to uh, enjoy themselves or get better at shooting, the better. Yeah, absolutely. So when, when you start off your, um, your three gun one one classes, you kind of give uh, people like an, um, introduction, like an overview of, of what, uh, what, what exactly three gun is. So how do you describe three gun to, uh, to someone who's never shot it before? Uh, usually just real quick overview. I say like three gun is an action shooting sport. That means that we use, um, rifle, pistol, and shotgun. We use it in a format where it involves us, um, design or developing a stage plan. And we do a lot of movement between that. We do a lot of moving while shooting. We shoot from different positions and we can transmit or we can transfer between the platforms to engage different targets. So I think uh, what a lot of people think when they think of like a three gun or like people that don't shoot competitively, when I tell them about that, they're like, oh, what, you shoot like clays? Like, I'm like, no, not really. It's completely different than that. It's more of like an athletic type sport than it is a uh, like a stand in one spot and delivered rounds down range type of sport. Right. Yeah. Most people have in their mind like uh, we're standing on a firing line and uh, and shooting targets at a certain distance, right? Yeah, they think like I'm gonna hold a shotgun or a rifle. I'm gonna shoot some paper like down a lane, yeah, and then transmit to a pistol and shoot down a lane and then shoot some clays. You know, like I'm using all three, but they don't really understand how they all kind of tie together into like one one movement when you're doing a stage. Right, and the uh, uh, the thing that I found like explaining one on one to people like what three gun is, I just ask, do you mind if I show you a video and then pull up whatever match I was shot most recently and show them. Uh, I usually cho- choose my best stage to show them, but uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll show them, uh, you know, a stage from from a, a match I shot recently. Yeah, that's that's the easiest way because people just don't really understand what it is until they they actually see it. The good right. thing is that most people that are seeking out a class already know what they're looking for, so I kind of just breeze over that real quick in case there's like anybody there that might be helping out. Like a lot of times we'll have a uh, we'll have like junior shooters there or like juniors that are going to be a junior shooter, 
and they'll be there with their parents and you, you tell one of them doesn't really know what's going on. So I kind of give an overview for anybody in there that might be like, you know, a boyfriend or a girlfriend of somebody that wants to shoot or like a parent. Right now. So your, your class is like a two part. It's a, uh, a classroom intro and then you actually go out and shoot two stages to get people indoctrinated into the, uh, the format of, uh, resetting and, and helping each other through it and stage breakdown and stuff like that. Do you, uh, bring any sort of like audio visual component into it of like, this is what three gun looks like, or do you wait until you guys get out on the, on the dirt? Usually we set up a couple stages. They kind of touch on like some basic, like three gun type stuff. We kind of do like a little bit of options. The targets are real easy and we do a little bit of movement and we usually set up two stages just so we can get used to the whole rotating thing and squatting up thing. Okay. But uh, just to show them the thing, usually I'll grab somebody that's there that's helping me, usually not myself or like Nick or Chip, but uh, we'll grab like one of the guys that's there to help us out because we'll have like six people there and we'll have them run the stage. Usually these guys are like our above average shooters at the club, but they're not the guys that are like crushing the match. That way they can kind of see someone run it. And then later on, um, after everybody goes to the stages, if they want, like we'll do some like exhibition t- style stuff and just kind of screw around and just have some fun for a while. Yeah. Sign autographs, stuff like that. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well then when, uh, when you tell people how to, uh, how to locate a match, I mean, that's like the basic overall thing, right? Is Facebook reach out to a, uh, match director. Um, you know, I always tell people to find like a local club in their area and then see if they have USPSA action shooting, three gun IDPA, something like that. And, uh, and use that as an intro. Are there, are there any other ways to, to find local matches? I mean, yeah, I mean, the internet's the easiest way now, or like looking up where local clubs aren't just going there and are like looking at their calendar and see if they have any events, typically club events on the weekends, like USPSA, IDPA, three gun, those are all open to the public. That's how the club creates revenue for anybody that wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's also possible that you could see where those events are like on their calendar and you could show up to the event without being ready to shoot at all. And you could just kind of scope it out for a little bit and just see what it looks like. Um, outside of that, I think practice score is a, a pretty good reference right now. I haven't used it myself cause I kind of know where all the clubs are locally. Mm-hmm. But I'm pretty sure you can go there and type your, your area and it'll show you like little dings of the, uh, on the map of where matches might be there close to you. Yeah. Practice score has been really good. Um, especially for me cause I've done a, like a lot of traveling around the uh, country and if I need to find, like a local match to fill some time or something like that. I can just go to practice score. It knows where I am or I can zoom in on where I am and see if there's yeah. any sort of like, you know, Wednesday, <clears throat> Tuesday night pistol league kind of things that I want to pick up. But, uh, it has a lot of, uh, uh, matches listed there as well. The downside that I found to that Matt is that if you have like, say, well, so you're in, you're in Michigan, I'm in Colorado. We kind of have a little bit of an off season, right? So right mm-hmm. now, if I go, look for action shooting in Colorado, there's no three gun because the, it only shows the, the matches that are, that are all already built in practice score. It doesn't show active clubs, right? Yeah. You're totally right. Yeah. yeah at that point, it's probably best to try to uh, locate some local clubs in your area and then see if they have like a website associated with that. Or if there's like a local gun owners forum, like Michigan gun owners and Indiana gun owners, and see if they have like a, a sub forum you can go to to try to contact anybody from that club and see what kind of events that they have. Yeah, so there's there's a little bit of sleuthing that needs to be done for uh, for finding a match. Yeah, it's it's really not it's not too bad. Um, pretty much everywhere you can find something going on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, so once you find a match, what's the uh, and you've reached out to someone you know where to go? What's the what's the next step as far as uh, being prepared for a match? Like, how do you Make sure you got all your gear and everything in order. Um, I think the best thing to do is like whatever match you find is find what rule set they're running or locate the rules that they have and just read through that like top to bottom. Um, a, a problem with three gun in general is that a lot of clubs have different rule sets. There's not like one standard rule set across all of three gun. Right. So something that I always tell people is when they're going to a match, like read the rules. It doesn't matter if you've been shooting for like a day or you've been shooting for five years or 10 years. Like when you go to a match, read those rules. And uh, the rules should really state out what kind of equipment that you need to uh, attend, a, attend a match. And usually when people think of three-gun equipment, they're thinking like race equipment and everything like that. You don't need anything real fancy. Like most people will have some kind of pistol. A lot of people have like an AR-15. And most people will have a shotgun, um, pump action, Mossberg 500. It doesn't matter what it is, Remington 870. And those are good enough to get started in the sport. And uh, I think a mistake that a lot of people make is like just going out and 
either waiting to start because they don't have the right equipment as they put it in their mind or uh, going out and buying a whole bunch of stuff before they go to their first match. Yeah. Going and buying a whole bunch of stuff before your first match is a terrible idea because um, you likely buy the wrong stuff because you don't know what you don't know at that time. You'll look, you know, at something on the package and it says three gun, which doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's proper for three gun and they're, and you're missing out on like the, uh, the people at the match that, that have experience in this game and have made those bad buying decisions and you can learn from them. Yeah. Most everybody is more than happy to uh, show you their gear, what they're using. And uh, you can also, if you go to your first matches with just whatever you have, um, you can kind of get a good idea as to what people want or maybe like what some local sponsors are in your area. Like everybody might, if you kind of look around or you travel around, you see that there's like little clicks like there's a lot of guys running Lancer stuff in like Pennsylvania, for example, because I think Lancer's close to that area. Right. And if you go to your local matches, you can see like, hey, look, it looks like 80 percent of people are using the same piece of gear. That kind of gives you a good direction to steer in rather than just going out and buying something like you said that says has three gun marked on it, which many times doesn't really mean anything of value to us. Right. And a lot of times like a, a marketing thing and <laughs> perhaps someone that designed or built it doesn't even really know what three gun is or <laughs> they just know that it's cool. Yeah. I think that happens more often than not, actually. Yeah, unfortunately. You know, it's it's uh, it's funny you mentioned the Lancer thing. I noticed that uh, when I was in Minnesota, I was like the only guy without a JP rifle. Yeah, JP's up in there, so everyone yeah. in that area is using JP. Yeah, people. Lucky dudes. I know, I know. People love to support, like, the hometown people, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. All right, so. We got our own uh, local, we got our own local businesses as well. Um, yeah, you guys have I mean, Trigicon, right? Yeah, Trigicon is is my primary sponsor. They're local to us. We have another uh, sponsor, Phoenix Ammunition. Right. They, uh, they're at every one of our matches. They're at every match in the area. So, I mean, once you see these people all the time, they like Trigicon has their own staff team as well. So they come to all the matches. And that's a good a good way to network with people um, that are just in the business in general. Definitely. Definitely. We, uh, we have that in Colorado here as well. Uh, Burris Optics is up in uh, Greeley. Uh, Burris oh, yeah. Steiner. And I think there's a third company that I always forget about, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, there's definitely like that sort of regional culture and traveling to matches all over the country. I've kind of, kind of seen it and it's, uh, it's pretty cool to be, uh, be a part of and, and watch it happen and, uh, yeah. and, and realize like, oh, there's like a thousand different ways to skin this cat. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, back to the original, uh, gear thing. So when uh, when I started shooting three gun, I didn't have air quotes the proper gear, right? Like I just went out with what I had, the uh, and the way I looked at it was like I'm gonna go out for training in case the shit hits the fan, right? And then yep. once I once I shot it, like I realized this is so much fun, and then I fell in love with the game portion of it, and so now all my gear is like dedicated gamer gear. But uh, but I started with a a Glock 17. Um, I started with uh, and an Uncle Mike's holster. <laughs> And oh, uh, yeah. I started with uh, a Mossberg 500 pump with a side saddle. And uh, that thing, I think, held six rounds. And then I reloaded from my pocket. And yep. then I had an AR-15 that I built myself with, like, a, I think the upper was, like, Palmetto State Armory or something like that. Then I put the lower together. Had a mil-spec trigger, but it had Magpul furniture, so it was really cool. Uh, yeah. And iron sights. So I shot limited division. But I had fun with that gear. Yeah, I, I actually have almost the same the same movement through the sport as you do. Like I started out just to get practice or mm -hmm. just to be actually like more versed and get training. And then I got into the game portion. Now I'm like a, basically a straight gamer. Yeah. But uh, my gear was very similar too. I had an 870, uh, an M&P pistol and a, a barrel, bottom barrel, like AR-15. And the thing is that like at a local match, depending on where you're at really, but I mean, even like at our local match, which I think there's a lot of, of really strong shooters at. You could you could win the match with that gear, honestly. Like it's not really holding you back that much. Like the short tube pump action shotgun, it's not going to be the best. But I mean, like the rifle and the pistol, like there's nothing fancy there, but it doesn't really need to be for the type of targets that you engage. Yeah, for sure. You know, there's there was uh, let's see, Colorado here, we shoot out to 200 yards because that's what our berms currently are able to go to. There's a couple places that are building 400 and 600 yard berms, which is kind of exciting. It's going to completely change the uh, the people that shoot three gun here. But yeah, the Iron sights would, were just fine for that. And then when I went to an aim point, that was even better. Um, yep. And it, like you said, that fixed barrel 18 and a half inch Mossberg is what I had. And uh, that was just fine because they don't, like Colorado, they don't really put 
shotgun targets like super far away or make you hunt for them and everything like they do in in places like minnesota so for club matches it was entirely fine yeah i think a mark of like a a good club match too is that it's going to be accessible for new people um a lot of clubs that you go to there are like i want to say like less competitive the match is going to be is going to the presentation on targets is going to be like real simple you're not going to have anything that's like out there that will require you to have any kind of crazy gear it might be actually like built around the fact that people are going to be there with like a, a pump gun with six rounds and the, even like our match, which I, I say is a little bit more competitive, we always put options and ways to keep it accessible for new people in there where you're not going to go to a stage and not be able to complete it because you have the wrong gear. Right. Yeah. And that's a, that's a cool thing. And I hear that from a lot of match directors because they, they do recognize like how intimidating it is to get into a three gun and they want to make it accessible and they want to keep people coming back. Um, now, but the there's a certain balance there, right? You want to make your your great shooters even greater, right? So how do you guys deal with that with that balance in in uh, in your match designs? Um, we do we put a lot of like options in, into the stages when we build them. Usually, if there's a target that I know is going to be like a real hard presentation for people, like I might put a four inch pistol plate or a couple of them at like twenty five or further for twenty five yards or further. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll make that like an optional shotgun target, but in order to use the shotgun on those, you're probably going to have to sacrifice like two seconds of movement to get there to pick up your shotgun. Or you might have to like double dip a window and go back with your rifle or something like that. Usually I'll walk the stage or me and we'll design our own stages and then I'll walk it like 20 times on my own to uh, see how it correlates in each different stage plan works out. And I want them all to be really, really similar, even though they're like five or six or seven different ways to run it. And I'll like wiggle targets around so that way it kind of stabilizes the stage. And then I'll uh, slightly reward the harder the harder presentation. So if somebody were to go ahead and like shoot those pistol plates with their pistol, they'd save like you know three yards of movement or something. I don't want to like reward the top guys the most, but I want to put something in there where they can flex their abilities in order to kind of squeak points off of people at every stage. Right, and then that encourages people to say like, oh, okay, if I would have shot that with my pistol, I would have saved, you know, like you said, a transition or going back to a window. And so they know next time. Like I need to practice my pistol skills. I need to get better at pistols so I can choose the harder option and excel at it. Yeah. I mean, this is a little bit off topic, but really my, our goal for our match in general is to, uh, is to build the shooters up so that way they can go to a national level match and like be able to compete. So we try to keep the same challenges you'd see there as far as like, you need to have a lot of stage planning. You need to know, know yourself. You need to know your gear and how you move and how long it takes you to do certain tasks. And uh, that's pretty prevalent at like the national level. So a lot of people I see go from like a local match to a national match. They get completely hosed right off the bat because it's just completely different the way that it's laid out. Oh yeah. And uh, we try to we try to bridge that gap. So we try to bring in new people, and then uh, make the make the stage accessible, but then allow people that are good to flex their skills and do different stage plans, so that way they can get built up for a national level match. Yeah, and and that's a very important thing too because if if uh, you know you have guys that are out there, you want them to keep coming back to your local match and use that as as practice, and then also. Um, uh, cultivate and encourage and mentor all the new shooters that are out there as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the more experience that we can get into the club, the better basically. So we have a, a good number of people that go shoot like bigger matches when they come back, all that data and all that information that they pull and all the things that they learn from the bigger matches is like a, is like a web. So they spread out to different States that surround Michigan. When yeah. they come back, they pull that information back with them and they can deliver that to like the newer shooters, the people that don't go to nationals. And uh, even if they're not attempting to do that, like it's not a big plan, like it happens naturally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So, okay. So Matt, we've got our, we've got our gear. We've, we've decided that, you know, as long as you have acceptable, safe gear, you can go shoot a match. So what's, uh, what's next? Once you get to uh, get to the match, what should you be conscious of before it even starts? Well, first thing is you want to be there before, you know, on time because uh, our match, like we're always trying to run the match on time. And people that show up late, it, it just causes problems for everybody. So uh, you want to be there on time. You want to register, sign in. They usually have like a table or somewhere you can go or like a house that is the registration table or the sign-in table. Uh, you go there. You pick a squad. Um, for anybody that wouldn't know, the match usually has like, if it has 100 people on 10 stages, they break it up into 10 squads of 10 people. You shoot one stage with those 10 people and then rotate with those 10 people to the next stage. Right. It's like, um, so it's you like have golf to, where you, you have in. your foursome and you go to different holes. Yep, exactly. And uh, so once you get in and sign in, you, you pick a squad. If you know anybody, you can try to squad up with your buddies. If not, you can just pick one or you can tell the RO or the person that's there be like, hey, I'm new. I've never shot before. Is there a squad I should be put on? And he might put you on his own squad or you might know some people that are extra helpful for new shooters. You might shove you over with them. 
Yeah, that's a good point because there there are there are always those extra helpful people that will uh, that are willing to help new people and get them through the match. Yeah, for sure. Uh, typically, after you sign in, I mean, they'll they'll give you a uh, they'll do a shooters meeting, which everybody co- gets brought in, and they kind of go over like any kind of announcements they want to do or any kind of like specific specific safety rules they want to talk about. And uh, from there, you would you would branch out into your squads and start shooting shooting the stages. Right. Okay. So when uh, when you're shooting a stage as a new person, what uh, what should you be doing? Um. Well, I'll probably this will probably be conflicting with a lot of people's opinions, and but when you first go to your when you go to your first match, almost everybody will tell you the same thing, and it's like don't worry about anything, just try to be extra safe and extra cautious. Um, I do agree with that to an extent, but we're also there to like have fun and to learn. So I think when you're on your stage and getting ready to shoot, be conscientious of like what you're doing and make sure you you have a focus on safety, but also like shoot shoot the guns, shoot fast, like do what you need to do, go through the stage and have a good time. Um, we don't want people to show up and then be paralyzed for the through like rules or paralyzed through safety. Like the people that show up already are are at at odds with themselves typically because of the whole uh, it's like public speaking type of thing being in the spotlight. Right. And uh, I know a lot of times like when I first started, everyone always told me even after I shot for a year, they told me slow down, get my hits, slow down, get my hits, slow down, get my hits. Like after every stage I shot, and uh, after a while, like my first couple of matches, I was pretty comfortable and I was pretty safe. Like I had the the muzzle discipline down i had the, the trigger control down and everything and uh like people telling me that was just like kind of giving me another mental block like i couldn't progress my skill set anymore because i was so focused on just being a, being a newbie and uh when you go to your first match i mean everybody's gonna say that but don't be paralyzed by fear through the rules or like be super on edge because you think that you're gonna do something and everyone's gonna get like jump on your ass jump on your ass because of it um you know keep your finger out of the out of the uh the trigger guard when you're moving keep the thing pointed down range and I try not to point at your feet when you're running with your pistol, like the, uh, the Hollywood cop type of movement. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the, uh, that's one thing that I see a lot, um, is, uh, we have to get rid of like a lot of the tacticalness that we've, you know, been watching on, uh, you know, dirty Harry in, in Magnum force yeah. and, and, uh, lethal weapon and, and stuff like that. So there's a lot of, uh, put the gun down, run, bring it up. And even with uh, with rifles, because unfortunately, so many of us have watched the uh, the Magpul DVDs that uh, we think that's exactly how it's supposed to be done. Yeah, I mean, you're I mean, every, you're going to get information overload. Everybody's going to be telling you how to do this, how to do that. Not like in any kind of way that's detrimental to you, but they're going to be like, hey, you should hold your pistol like this. You should do that. You know, they're going to be trying to help you out as much mm-hmm. as they can. Probably get pounded with information the first time you're at a match. Sometimes I think um, people are overly helpful like it. You know, if you, uh, yeah, for sure. If a new, if a new person says within earshot or electronic earshot of, say, five shooters, if they say to one shooter, how would you, you will get six answers. And I, oh, yes, yeah, for yes sure. I know that math doesn't add up. But the, uh, um, I, I, I kind of caution, like, from time to time, like, hey, you know, I would choose one person to listen to here and then decide if that person's full of shit and move on <laughs> rather than, yeah, I think trying to accept six different answers from six different people. Yeah. I've always kind of been out on my own. Like I work with my little clique of guys that I train with, but really I don't really listen to what other people are doing, like from a mental state. And I don't really pay attention to what other people are doing from a technique. I just figure out what works for me mm-hmm. and uh, how I, what I can do to make it the fastest, even though sometimes it might be goofy or people in the might not agree with it. Like I know from my own testing that this is the fastest way that I can do it at this time in my life, you know? And, uh, I think everybody that tells you something, they're all trying to be helpful and everybody has information, but in every piece of that information has like some truth to it. And you need to just kind of, after a while, you'll be able to decipher which parts are useful to listen to, which parts aren't useful to listen to. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's you get a, a lot of information point. and you can take, you can take it all to heart and everyone's trying to help you. But I mean, just cause some guy tells you you should do something one way doesn't mean that you can necessarily get stuck on it. Like if you're out there on your own training or practicing and you find a better way or someone else tells you something different, I mean, try everything. Like try it out and figure out for yourself what works and what doesn't work. That's one of the best parts of the uh, the shooting sports in general. Yeah, especially when you're new because you're like a blank slate, you know? Yeah, you got so many things to work on when you're new. I mean, after your first match, you'll probably have like five or six things immediately that you know you're just absolutely terrible at that you can go work on and see immediate benefits at your next match. Yeah. Yeah, one uh, one thing I want to add to your, uh, your statement about uh, gun handling there would be um, I – 
notice clay shooters and a lot of hunters just kind of hold their their gun like they're carrying a lunchbox and uh and they yeah. ended up pointing it at a lot of people and uh, i've seen that at practical shooting matches as well with someone with like a hunting background or a clay shooting background thinks like oh this is an empty gun it's okay to just go ahead and point it at my entire squad and that is never okay at you're a, talking about when uh when they're done shooting or are you talking about when they're actively shooting the stage done shooting oh yeah yeah, yeah that's yeah. that's true we got like I see that a lot. I've actually disqualified people for that. Like not necessarily anyone that's new, yeah. but um, I've seen people kind of like wipe the crowd with their, their firearms when they're walking around with it. Typically when you're done shooting the stage, the R will tell you, you know, to clear your firearms and clear them out. He, he confirms them as clear, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, they're always safe and we want to muzzle people. If anything, we should know at that point, Hey, the guns, you know, it should be clear. The R will clear it. You cleared it. It should be clear. But just from an etiquette standpoint, you don't want to be pointing guns at people. That's correct. And, uh, I, I've had that as well. Like when I'm downrange resetting and then, uh, you know, I'll see a guy talking to the timer and he's pointing a shotgun at me and I don't really like that so much. Cause I can't tell from 20 yards away if it's loaded or unloaded or what. Yeah. You'll kind of see the wave happen, you know, like when somebody does that, like all the people standing behind the, the firing line kind of like move out of the way real quick or they duck or dodge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it, it does happen. Be cognizant of it. Uh, you know, whatever your range is, uh, I guess, uh, social norm is up or down just keep it pointed in yeah. in that safe direction generally in in uh most of the matches i've been to it's muzzle up carry them off go put them on the uh either the preload table or back in your bags into the berm and uh and don't point them at people which seems pretty simple yeah i find that the new shooters actually a lot sometimes have like better muzzle control like the idea of where the muzzle's at just not when they're shooting the stage like they want to like wipe their feet and stuff from doing the hollywood cop like keeping the pistol down type thing you know yeah but uh when it comes to like keeping the pistol down range they usually do a pretty decent job at it it's when people start getting like um you know they think that they're they're awesome now that's when they start getting like careless and not really paying attention to what they do that's when they start breaking the 180 on the stage which is what we really don't want to do right. but uh new shooters typically don't have too many 180 problems from my experience it's usually the people that are just just getting comfortable and they get a little too comfortable. Like we are using dangerous firearms that can hurt or kill somebody. So we always want to make sure that we're safe. But, uh, like I was saying before, I mean, obviously be as safe as possible, but remember that you're there to learn and have fun. Don't be paralyzed with fear. Sure. Well, and so this, uh, this podcast is for, uh, for new folks. So if someone's listening and is not really familiar with the 180, why don't, why don't you describe what the, uh, what we're talking about there with the 180? The 180 is just represents like 180 degrees. So it's like an invisible line that follows you downrange as you move through the stage. And uh, if your muzzle gets close to the 180 line, sometimes you'll get like the courtesy of somebody saying, hey, muzzle, like you're getting real close or the RO might say something to you. But uh, it's typically not something that's that fine in the rules. Like they don't have to give you a warning. If you get too close to 180 or you break that 180 plane, so you're basically sh- pointing up range slightly, um, you can get disqualified for that. And uh there's also times where, depending on how the stage is designed, the 180 might move or change, or depending how the bay is built. So if there's ever any questions about the 180 or what you can and can't do, like if you're going, if you're planning on engaging a target from a certain spot, and you're not sure if it's safe or not safe, or if it's part of the 180 or not part of the 180, you can always ask the RO at that time. Yeah, and the uh, the time to do that is is obviously before you shoot. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll I'll coach people that are you know new and going through the stage. Like if they stop and have a question, I'll, I'll answer the question, you know, as an RO typically, mm-hmm. uh, typically coaching is not allowed, but at a club level, like it doesn't really matter that much. Like there's a lot of coaching. You want to keep it to a minimum. If you're like, you know, you're there with your buddy, you don't want to be yelling stuff at him because the only thing the your buddy should hear really, if he's not ex- right there and ready to accept something from the RO, like he asked him a question, the only thing he should be really listening to is like a stop command. Like if somebody were to yell stop, it could be a spectator or anybody. That would mean that you want to stop what you're doing immediately due to whatever reason that it, that could have occurred to initiate a stop. So when people start heckling or getting a little too comfortable in the back lines, it can cause a lot of confusion for the shooter. And it could also potentially be a safety issue. Yeah, and I've actually seen um, some heckling and I've, I've experienced a, a person um, enthusiastically telling a story that contained the word stop while I was shooting. And... Uh, <laughs> And I just, uh, I stopped and like looked at the RO and the RO just kind of shrugged at me like, well, yeah, I've had that <laughs> more than once where somebody gets excited about something that happened and I kind of stop what I'm doing. And I like put, point the gun in the berm and I just look back 
at the RO where I look back at the crowd and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. And then I, I realize that I'm just standing there for no reason and I take off. <laughs> yeah. So I, like half a dozen minutes. I, uh, I'm of the opinion, like I heard stop. I'm stopped. Like now, yeah, now we're going to unload and show clear and we're going to do this over again. <laughs> yep. But yeah, so the, uh, the stop command is the important one that you, um, for, for new folks out there, the stop command is the important one that, uh, you know, generally means there's something unsafe that happened or you're about to do something unsafe or you did do something unsafe and, uh, just stop, freeze and wait for further instruction from the, the range officer. When we're not shooting, when we, when we're done shooting, what, what should a shooter be doing? What should an individual so, be doing? <laughs> yeah. When you first go to your stage, if you're new, when you first break up from the shooters meeting, everything, if you're a new shooter and you go to your stage, alert your RO that you're new. They'll probably move you to the bottom of the list so you can kind of see what's going on. But typically when you're not shooting, they, uh, there's a couple of things you need to be doing. So they usually have the shooter that's shooting at the, that, that time. That's the shooter. And then they have a person that's on deck and a person that's in the hole. Those are the top three people. So the person on deck would shoot after the shooter and then so forth. Um, if you're not one of those three people, you should really be, um, you should have your gear together, your mags loaded, all your, all your stuff ready to go. And, uh, when the person is done shooting the stage and the range officer calls it as safe, you need to go down and reset the targets. Um, like I said earlier, we're all pretty much volunteers and we all need to do work. So I do work setting up the stage, designing stages, me and the other match directors. And, uh, even the competitors when they show up, they also need to do work. So we're all, we're all paying a fee. We're all enjoying that clubs, uh, that venue at a cost. And I mean, we all have to work as a community to make sure that the match can go through like smoothly. So when the, uh, when the shooter is completed, you need to go down and reset the targets. So we're picking up the steals, we're pacing the papers, um, wait for the RO to score anything. And then, uh, once everything's cleared out, the RO will check their stage for clear and then we'll go to the next shooter. Um, other than that, like I said, make sure all your, your gear is ready to go. There's nothing worse than like being called up to shoot, even though the order is the same every time. And then the person's not ready and that kind of causes a delay. And whenever you cause a delay in the uh, the stage, it can, it can kind of back up the stage and people that are in the squad behind you get backed up. So it can just cause problems. So we need everybody to work mm-hmm. and uh, we need people to be ready to shoot when it's their turn to shoot. Yeah, and I would say that the uh, the best way to make friends on the range when you're a new person is to uh, to reset with a hustle, which means, you know, paste targets, steal it, <clears throat> steal that is knocked down, put it back up, that kind of thing. Once, uh, once obviously it's uh, safe to do so. So yep. the, uh, um, like you said, it's a, it's a participation sport in that we get to, uh, we get to shoot, but it's also a participation in that we reset and help, um, make the stage back to normal for the next shooter. Yep. And then, uh, I guess the next thing you would do if you, when you move out to your squad in that way is that you would be waiting after you're all prepared and you're resetting stages, you would wait until you're the person that's the shooter or the person that's on deck. Um, a lot of times the RO will tell you if you're the shooter on, that's on deck, they have like a spot for you to stand. So that way you're ready when the, uh, the shooter is completed. When the shooter is completed and the stage is reset, the RO will call you up. At that time, he'll say, uh, give you the load and make ready command. You might have your pistol in your hand. You might have your rifle. It depends on how the stage is set up. So you might load your pistol first. Typically, you uh, load it under his discretion, and then you would holster it. Um, it could depend on the stage, though. You load your rifle, load your shotgun, and uh, he'll take you to the start position. And at that time... They ask, usually I ask the shooter if he has any questions about the stage because sometimes they can be confusing. And uh, if not, I ask if the shooter's ready. They, uh, it doesn't really matter if they say yes or no. I just say shooter ready and then give it a pause. So you don't have to acknowledge shooter ready at all. And then I say uh, stand by and I'll hit the button on the buzzer. And once the, button, the buzzer goes off, you can complete the stage as safely as possible, as fast as possible, any way that you want. And then uh, when it's done... What I typically tell people is when they're done shooting the stage is just wait for the RO's commands. Uh, being an RO in general, like I said, is a volunteer job and it can be a tough job. I see a lot of people like try to hustle the range commands like they know the RO's going to come over there and tell them to unload and show clear. So they just start doing it and racking rounds out and letting them fly across the stage and trying to catch them in the air. Um, I've never been a big fan of any of that. I don't do that. I just wait with my pistol pointed down range if I ended with the pistol. And I wait for the RO to come over and he'll say to me or she will say to me, unload and show clear. At that time, I pull the slide back. Show that's clear. Let them look down the barrel. They'll say, you know, hammer down and holster, hammer down and holster. Um, I suggest not rushing the stage command set in any case. Like sometimes the ROs will get kind of salty about it to begin with. But uh, if you rush the stage commands at the end of the stage, I mean, there's probably not anything that bad's going to happen. It's kind of disrespectful. If you rush them at the beginning of the stage, you'll probably get disqualified. You don't want to load your pistol until the RO tells you. Right. The other thing I would add to that is that uh, 
when you're loading your pistol and hol- holstering it, uh, it's it's not a tactical situation, right? So you can look where your your pistol is going, look your pistol into the holster, make sure that you're not grabbing your shirt or your jacket and getting part of that in there. And then when uh, when you're unloading and showing clear, you're not on the – oh, and obviously when you're loading and make writing, you're those two times you're not on the clock. So you don't need to hurry that and, you know – Obviously, don't don't take a, a ton of time and, and waste time, but don't hurry through it to where you're moving so fast that you're going to cause an unsafe situation. Point the gun at yourself, point the gun at someone else, that kind of thing. It's uh, it's you know, time's over. We're done shooting here. Now let's just make that gun safe, and then we can go pick up those targets. Yeah, a mistake that I see a lot of people do when they're new and they first start out is when they're holstering the pistol, like at the end of the stage, mm-hmm. they, they're kind of excited and they're ready to go back and get out of the way because they want to like hurry up and get out so people can set the stage. But uh, they'll they'll turn like in the direction of their holster. So if they're right-handed, they'll turn clockwise and holster their pistol. Uh, just You want to make sure just stay facing downrange and then holster. And once it's holstered and you can feel it and it's clicked and it's good to go or it's retained in there pretty well, then go ahead and move. But yeah. people get excited. They'll do the holster and the turn all in one motion, and it's really easy to like wipe the RO or wipe your feet or your legs or like turn up range slightly when you do that. Yeah, I saw that one recently at a uh, an indoor bowling pin match. The dude was like basically three steps off the line before he had his pistol holstered, and uh, he had to turn around and and uh, and do all that. So he pointed his gun at like three or four different people. It was kind of sketchy. The other one I saw recently, Matt. I don't know if you've uh, you've experienced this one yourself, but you know, if you if you've uh, got like a a magazine that you've dropped on the ground, or even that last round that you racked out, I'll see people bend over to pick that up before the pistol is completely holstered, and now they're pointing yep. that gun backwards toward the uh, crowd. Yeah, something else that I do is I I kind of just let those rounds and mags and everything hit the ground. Like I don't worry about them. Like until my guns are like cleared out and they're safe, I don't worry about them at all. Like, you know. People that are real, real well experienced, they want to do cool stuff or whatever when they're or they're unloading and showing clear. That's fine, but uh, I mean, I I'm pretty experienced at this point. I just there's no point in that. Like I, I don't waste any time. It's not adding time to my stage. I unload, show clear. When everything's safe, I'll bend over, pick up the mags, bend over, pick up the ammo. You see people like they're so worried about picking up those mags that they're they're like picking up mags while the RO is over there telling them to unload and show clear. Yeah. Like there's plenty of time that while they're resetting the stage, you don't have to hurry up and do that before you're getting cleared out. Yeah. I, I had a guy recently that, um, was, uh, talking about like, Oh, I engaged that one and that one. And it's like, do let's unload, let's unload your pistol here. We can talk about this afterwards while we're scoring yep. stuff. No big deal, but let's make sure your stuff is uh, clear here so we can get people down range and we don't have hot firearms sitting around. Yep. I agree. Yeah. All right. So, uh, the, uh, um, the unload show clear. You're, you're you're done shooting. Now, what uh, what's your responsibility? Um, usually, if I'm done shooting or the people that are at my match, I allow them to you know skip out on resetting the stage for a minute there while they get all their stuff together. And then uh, usually, by the time you get your stuff together, the next shooter will be done. You can go out and reset again. And then during that downtime, you really want to be loading up your mags and everything for the next stage. Um, usually, it's it's I don't want to say it's hectic, but a lot of times you can kind of get rushed a little bit. So you get done with your stage, everybody wants to move to the next one. So it's possible that you might be like the second shooter up on the next stage, but you don't have any of your mags loaded. So now you're wasting your time that you could be using to look at the range or look at the stage. You're over there trying to load your mags up real quick or get your gear together. Um, If you have any downtime at all after you're done shooting, get all your gear back together, figure out where you want to, like put all your stuff back in your car or back in your bags, whatever you want to do, and then start loading up your mags, getting your stuff ready for as if you were going to shoot that stage again because you're going to be moving over to the next one pretty soon anyway. Mm Mm-hmm. All right. So then, and then, uh, of course, once your uh, your mags are loaded back up, back to resetting, which is a huge one. Yeah. There's usually <laughs> usually you can load your mags a little bit, and then you know the the shooter's done, and you can go out and reset, and then you come back and load your mags a little bit, and the shoot next shooter will be done. You go out and reset and come back. So you kind of do it in like chunks. Yeah. For sure. All right. So then, uh, um, once the uh, the range day is over, once you've shot all the the stages. What is uh what, what's what's kind of the the norm at your local club? Um, usually out like our ROs at the beginning of the day, we walk around do like an RO walkthrough, and we kind of just we discuss certain parts of the stage or certain parts of the range brief or the stage brief just to kind of get the ROs all on the same page because we do traveling ROs just for the normal monthly, and uh, I'll tell the ROs at that time like how we want the stage to be torn down. So again, being at a match, you have to do a little bit of work usually. I mean, it really depends on where you're at, but typically the the shooters help tear down the match after it's done. 
So uh, I'll tell the ROs what we want to do. So whatever stage you end on, once your your squad's done shooting, it's the last shooter. Um, at that point, everybody should be done for the day, unless there's something else that goes on. And uh, normally, I, I have some kind of plan for the, the shooters to clear out their stage. So the RO tells them what they need to do. Like if they need to move walls or barrels, usually it's like involves pulling the steels up and putting them in a pile, moving like the barrels off to one side. And uh, at that time, when the stage is torn down and everything's cleared out, everybody's leaving. I usually let people just go hog wild and pick up whatever brass they want. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, that's that's uh, something that we didn't cover in the actual shooting part. Generally, um, kind of leave that on the ground. You don't don't pick it up, right? Whereas if yeah. you're going to the range for like a range day, there's a lot of, uh, what the hell is it called? Uh, brass hounds, people that just kind of like nose to the ground. And, and I've seen that from a lot of new folks that are out there picking up brass and we're all – ready to shoot it's like hey buddy you got to come back here can't just be downrange picking up uh you know shiny things yeah some matches will be called like a lost brass match they'll usually tell you that ahead of time it means like your brass when it hits the ground it's not yours anymore it's like part of basically part of the match fee mm-hmm. and uh they just they do that because they don't want people walk around picking up brass when they're supposed to be shooting a stage like it delays the delays the match at my match i usually tell people hey don't pick up your brass like some people will do it a little bit if they're shooting something weird but uh, typically, people leave the brass on the ground when the whole day is over. There's usually so much brass that you know you you can pick up as much as you want. You can walk between stages and pick it up. Yeah. But during the stage itself, when you're done shooting, um, that's usually not a good time to be picking up brass at a three gun match. I know at like pistol matches or like IDPA, a lot of times like picking up your brass is part of the stage setup, or like the the range pickup. Like people will be picking up your brass and hand it to you after you're done with the stage. Yeah. But uh, typically three gun there's just too much stuff going on it kind of delays the stage so so we usually say that for the end of the day well yeah we had uh we did that at my uh my old range that i first started shooting at and we joked that this one guy uh had named all his brass and had been shooting with them since the 70s (laughs) yeah i've seen that guy before (laughs) yeah (laughs) he's got special marks on uh on all the head stamps like with a sharpie so he knows which ones are his yeah, they're color coded. Yeah, exactly. I'm not kidding. Well, so that, yeah. Well, Steve always has red, and Jim's got black, so that must be Jim's. Yeah, and don't step on it. Don't step on anything that has a colored head stamp on it. <laughs> yeah, you'll hear about it. Yeah. Yeah. Good times. All right. So then, uh, once everything's torn down at at my club, generally, um, someone will come around with like a uh, like a flatbed trailer with a pickup truck. We just load all that stuff on there and take it over to the. Uh, whatever shed or, or hut that it uh, goes in and put that in its, uh, in its proper place. Um, I usually, if I'm, you know, I haven't been to a club in a while, I find myself asking a lot of, where does this go? Where does this go? Where does this go? And uh, it, it pays, um, pays dividends to remember where all that stuff is going in its proper place because someone put a lot of time into uh, stacking that stuff in there and uh, it makes it a lot easier to set up a match when, it, when you come back. Yeah, usually for our match, it takes me pretty much the whole day to set it up with with the other guys. And uh, I mean, we'll be out there for 12 hours or so, maybe setting up a local match. And then the next day we show up, I'm usually there an hour, an hour and a half early along with the other match directors. And then uh, when the match is over, I end up staying like another two hours later. So it ends up being a really, really long weekend for any of the match directors at our club. And uh, when the shooters can pitch in a little bit and help tear down the stage, I mean, we always tear down the stages pretty quick takes me a whole day to put them up. takes like 10 minutes to tear them down. Yeah. Usually at our club, everyone kind of jets after they tear down the stage because it's kind of oddly shaped, like the, their trails and everything. But we go through and pick stuff up. Anybody that stays behind to help us like load up the trailer, like you are saying, is is super helpful. Yeah. And, um, you know, t- tell me uh, tell me if I'm okay in this, Matt, or if I'm kind of a jerk. So I, I'm not really good at getting up super early. And, uh, every match here in, uh, in Colorado has like, for me, a two hour drive to get to. So I kind of make the concession of like, Hey, I can't be out there early to help with setup, but I'll stay until every target's put away. And then that makes me feel better. Now, is that okay? Or am I kind of a jerk in that? No, I think that's fine. Like, I mean, it sounds like you guys set up and shoot the same day. We don't do that. We do it on opposite days. So, but I have shot matches where uh, you show up, I've showed up like on the day to set it up. So I set it up on like Saturday shot the whole match on Sunday and then tore or shot the whole match on Saturday after setting up and then torn down on Saturday the same day. I mean, that is an incredibly long day. Like that is just punishing. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, a lot of our matches, like if we, if we have like, say, uh, say five stages, like they'll set up two or three or major components of several stages. 
uh, the day before. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, last minute touches of, you know, walls and things like that. Cause it gets, it gets windy where we shoot out on the plains. So they don't set up so, things overnight that can blow away. Yeah, that makes sense. We, uh, I, th- I think we can build like a really, a really good like club level match because we spend like the whole day setting it up basically and walking it like a hundred times and having the other ROs walk your stage and vice versa. But, uh, so we usually, we don't have that whole, that whole setup part. I'm sure that if we were setting up the day of the more people we could get out there to help just move stuff, uh, the better. A lot of times people come out and help us on the Saturday before the match. And, uh, I'm kind of designing the stage. So it gets to a point where like, I can't only have so many people help anyway. Right. Like I can only really have like, two guys helping me because I don't like not that I don't want them touching the stage, but I, I'll put a lot of like really tight angles and stuff in there and like move stuff around because of the options. And it takes a lot of like eyeballing it and walking back and forth and moving things around. But I still need people to do like um, grunt style work, like hammering and stakes takes a long time. I'm um, just loading up the trailer back and forth or, or grabbing certain things I might have forgot. Yeah, the, the dude that hammers in all the stakes is the unsung hero of the match. <laughs> yeah, we actually got one of those. Uh, one of the guys that we shoot with, he's an engineer, you know, like a lot of shooters are. And uh, he took a a hammer drill and we made like an attachment for it that connects to uh, those those big stakes that we use. And you just hammer drill them in the ground. It's pretty much the greatest thing ever made. Oh, that's awesome. You gotta, you gotta yeah. send me like a picture of that or put a video on Instagram or something. Yeah, I'll grab one. I think I saw uh, some of the, uh, the SMD guys using one too. It was pretty similar. Ours had like a little collet to keep the nail trapped until it like hits the bottom. But uh, it's pretty much just a, a hammer drill that has like a, a flat face on it and you can just run run stakes in with it. It's brilliant. I love it. All right. So then uh, once the match is torn up, high five and you're out? Yeah, pretty much. Um, like I said, you can pick up brass you want. Usually I'll be there for a while. Like we're going through like financials and stuff like that. So um, if somebody wants to stick around, like, you know, talk or bullshit or talk about stages or you know, they have any questions. Usually I'm, I'm sticking around after the match for that. I don't know how it is at, at other clubs, you know, but typically there's like a, a little dead zone after the match where you can kind of hang out and talk to people if you want. Yeah. And then, uh, one thing I liked we, about, uh, well, shooting up in, uh, Minnesota at forest Lake is that there's a barbecue place nearby. So there's like a opportunity for, uh, beer and barbecue afterwards in Colorado. It's like everyone scatters in different directions because we're out you know, so far out in the boonies. Oh yeah, for sure. We, uh, I mean, there's plenty of guys here that they all get together and like go to the sushi place or they all go together and go to like the burger joint down the road or something. But, uh, yeah, you might get into like a, a little click there where you got like, you know, once a month you go out, shoot the match and then afterwards you go out to dinner or whatever. Like after you meet some people, you might get invited out or whatever. But, uh, but yeah, it's, there's a, there's a good sense of camaraderie in general and like the shooting sports and it's a pretty small community. So once you get in there and you start meeting people and you shoot some stages and shoot some matches, you get real comfortable real quick. Like that first hurdle we were talking about at the beginning when we first started talking here, the mental hurdle, mm-hmm. like that, that goes super fast. Yeah. And after that, you're more worried about just not being nervous on the clock just so you can shoot better. Not so that way, you know, people aren't looking at you. So you're nervous. You're nervous because you want to shoot the best you can. So you're trying to get rid of your jitter so we can make better shots. Not necessarily because you're like worried about anybody being judgmental of your performance. Yeah. That's a very good point. Well, so, um, one of the things we touched on quite, um, quite, quickly was just gear right so we kind of said like the uh the gear that you have is okay so come out with that see where you fall have fun and if you like it you know then you can kind of kind of choose from there so obviously you want to get recommendations from some of the uh the better shooters at your match um and if you you know you got a buddy that knows what he's talking about take recommendations there as well um let's let's talk about like the different divisions that you can uh that you can be in and what uh what gear fits in in those divisions and obviously this is going to be kind of general because you know each rule set has its own little caveats but there's there's a lot of similarities between uh between the rule sets yeah i think the uh the first thing we should probably talk about is like your your belt setup or like how you carry your gear mm-hmm. that's the one that seems like get people the most like a lot of people have the shotgun the stuff they understand you need a shotgun for a three gun but uh, people people in general from what i could tell go hog wild on the belt like the only thing you really need for your first match is a holster that will retain your pistol and won't fall out when you run. Right. Um, other than that, you don't need a whole lot. Like you can load pistol mags out of your pocket. You almost never load rifle mags anyway, so you can load those out of your pocket, no problem. And if you really have to, you can load shotgun shells out of your pocket as well. Uh, I know my first three gun match I went to, I had like you know like six shell caddies, like a spot for two AR mags on my belt, a spot for like four pistol mags in my pistol. Jeez. And uh, even, even yeah, I was like super loaded up, and I realized like I took all of it off like the first stage, so I didn't need any of it. 
yeah. I just needed the holster. So, I mean, my normal setup for a belt, like my, my normal setup without moving anything around is like a pistol holster, um, a one, one, eight round shell caddy for shotgun, a dual pistol magazine pouch and a rifle pouch just because, and I barely ever use a rifle pouch, but I don't like going into a stage without like an extra source of ammunition. Like I don't want to go, if I'm going to use one mag in the stage, I bring two mags. If I'm going to use two mags, I use three mags or I bring three. Mm -hmm. So that's really my basic setup. It's only got four things in it, a holster, a caddy, a dual pistol pouch and a, a rifle pouch. And that's, that's what I run 90% of the time. You know, and I'll, I see people come out and they'll have like 16 shell caddies and like four pistol mags and things like that. <laughs> I'm very similar to you in, in uh, that setup. I, I guess uh, for shotgun, kind of kind of the way that I do it is I'm, I'm a little bit more, um, I guess, conservative or pessimistic, d- depending on who <laughs> who's talking there yeah. um, than you are. So I, I will load up with as many shells to complete the stage as I need. Uh, I will put that on my belt and then, uh, I have the, the shock, whatever's in the shotgun is, is like bonus. So, you know, at the end, if everything goes right, I should have like nine shells left. Right. So yeah, that's a good plan. Yeah. That's kind of, uh, uh Chris Anderson told me that a bunch of years ago and I kind of stuck with that and it seems to work well for me, but I'm the exact same way with rifle and pistol. I take one more magazine than I think I'm going to need. Yeah, I kind of do the caddies. Like if I plan on loading four, there's like eight rounds in one caddy. I bring two caddies. You know, if I touch a caddy, I'm going to bring an extra one. So if I'm planning on using two caddies for the stage, I'll bring three. But oh, okay. uh, really the only changes in my belt too much is uh, I add or subtract caddies based upon the shotgun count. Right. Otherwise, it stays the same all the time. Yeah, and I generally take the uh, the caddies off just because they run up in front. So they're it's easier to reset stages and and uh, lean over and, and pick up uh, steel off the ground. Yeah, same thing with me. Cool. So then, uh, um, let's let's talk about uh, divisions real quick. So there's generally three divisions, you know, and it depends on where you, where you shoot at. There can be more, but um, we we kind of run basically three divisions here in uh, Colorado, and and I know that in Minnesota, like heavy is a is a big division. Do you guys have a lot of heavy shooters in Michigan? Uh, no, we, we are actually only run the four divisions. We run the, the three standard divisions and then heavy and that's it. Typically we have like maybe one heavy shooter. Okay. Well, and, and for, uh, for folks that are listening and don't know, heavy is like basically a 308 rifle. And then, uh, you know, depending on the rule set, other things that go along with that, which can be, can be a pump shotgun, can be a se- semi-automatic, can be a 45 pistol, can be a nine millimeter. Um, and that's super rule set dependent on that one there. Yeah, that's heavy as a specific rule set. I'm um, talking about that one first. is not is not super popular right now. In general, it's more expensive to shoot because you need 308, and a lot of times you need a 45. Um, but really, if you if you plan on shooting heavier, a 308 and a 45, and like a 12 gauge um, appeals to you, make sure that you read the rules. Like I said, always read the rules, but read the rules specifically for heavy if you're going to participate in that because the heavy division rules are uh, very non-standard. They they change a lot depending on where you go. Whereas the normal three standard classes that you see pretty much everywhere. They're pretty much the same depending. I mean, there might be little intricacies here and there, but they're pretty much always the same. Right. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about those, uh, those three different divisions that are, that are kind of standard overall. Yeah. The, uh, the first one that I would usually would talk about would be like irons or tactical irons or limited. This is usually defined by the, uh, the AR-15 or the rifle they're using that necessarily an AR-15 can have a, can have an op. It's either iron sights or it has a non-magnified optic, like an aim point or an MRO. And uh, the pistol is non-compensated, non-optic, usually has a limited magazine capacity or length of like 141.25 millimeters. Uh, so any standard pistol mag is just fine to use in that class. And then uh, the shotgun is limited in there. It's either limited in tube capacity or uh, you definitely can't have a comp. And you definitely can't have an optic on that that shotgun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so for like, uh, for example, like a three gun nation rule set, I think limits it to eight in the tube. Is that right? Yeah, so there's kind of like two different two different ways that tack irons are limited goes. It's either, um, it's almost always you can have one optic on the rifle and it has to be non magnified. Um, that's pretty much standard across them. Yeah. Three gun nation style is the pistol's limited to 15 rounds and the shotgun's limited to eight. And then most every other uh, rule set, the pistol's limited to 141 millimeter mag length, which is like roughly 22, 23, nine millimeter rounds. And the uh, the shotgun is there's no real rules for tube length, but typically what you'll see is like a 12 round tube. Right. Yeah. Most people run 12 round tube and in, in most rule sets, it's uh nine rounds in the gun to, uh, to start. Yeah. At the, at um, the buzzer. 
Yeah, I think at like a club level, attack irons can actually be like a, if it doesn't have the limitations on magazine capacity, so it's not like a three-gun nation match, attack irons can actually be like a, a beneficial class to shoot. It's not necessarily like the lowest division. Like a lot of people see it as like the lowest gear requirement division. Yeah. Where a lot of times using that MRO on like a club match where that only goes up to 50 yards might be a uh, a benefit over using like a magnified optic where you're never going to adjust it anyway. Like you lose weight, you lose the parallax. And attack uh, irons can be a, a very competitive class. If that's the gear that you have, you can run in there and shoot. It typically doesn't have the uh, participation that like some of the bigger classes do, but uh, it's definitely not like something that you need to like, you know, you have to move up to the next classes at some point. You can shoot irons for your entire shooting career. Yeah, and you know, since I've I, I've love irons. Like I started in in uh, irons, uh, but once I started shooting targets past like 400 yards, I was like, you know, maybe some magnification would be kind of fun here. But yeah. um, in in Colorado, where our matches go out to uh, 200, like. Iron should be huge because you don't need a scope, you know, 200 yeah, yards is for, you know, even I'm 37 years old. I I think you're, you're a little bit younger, aren't you? Aren't you like 31, 32? 31, 31. So we have pretty decent eyes still. And, uh, Good enough. 200 yards is not bad with, with a red dot or like a, you know, prism scope or something like that. Yeah, our, our local match only goes out to 100, the one that I run. That's all we have. So, mm-hmm. I mean, at that point, attack irons, if there's no magazine capacity limitations, it's actually, like, the preferred class probably to shoot. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, over the other ones, I mean, aside from, like, maybe open. But uh, if you start getting out to, like, 200, that might be more – that might depend more on, like, what you're doing, like, uh, or how old you are, how well you can see, or what optic that you have. Yep. Um, Like, when you go to your match, if that's all you have, just use what you have. If you can't engage a target and you can't hit it, or you don't think that you can hit it, you can run past it. It doesn't matter. Like, you don't have to engage it to continue. Just shoot at it a couple times. If you don't think it's going to happen, then just leave. Yeah. But, uh, don't get hung up on it. Yeah. Depending on your local match. Like, if your local match is going out to like 500 yards, then you might have to worry about like getting, you know, an optic or whatever. But there's people that are still shooting irons out to 500 yards. Yeah. And like you said, 200 yards with an iron, with an irons is, I mean, it's probably not a benefit over like the optics classes like the magnified optics classes, but it's definitely not going to like kill you. Like you can still engage targets at that distance. Like that's a perfectly reasonable distance for a red dot. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and then, you know, you're scored against your division anyway. So you're only competing against the people with the same gear as you. Yeah, that's true. You're only shooting, if you're shooting irons, you're shooting against the irons guys. And that's, that's it. Yeah. And that's an important distinction. But you know, when, when, uh, when I lived in Texas, I would go shoot like uh dissident arms matches and, uh, you know, I remember the first first time I went there, Mike's giving the uh, Mike Whiteside's giving the shooters brief, and he's like, you know, we're not going to shoot too far uh, today because we had to pull some targets in because swamp and flooding, blah blah blah. So we're only shooting out to four thirty. And, <laughs> and in my head, you know, coming from local matches here in Colorado, I'm like, you're kidding me! Like four thirty is not too far. Like what is far for you guys? So in in that case, you know, a lot of people. Um, want to add some magnification to to their rifle right so variable scope and now they're bumping into a different class and that takes them to what's uh generally called like tac optics optics or tac scope um or in three gun nation they call it a uh, practical right yeah so i mean that's this tac optics or whatever you want to call it is is the most popular class by far i mean typically you'll see like 70 percent of the the whole base there is going to be shooting that that one class um, that's pretty much the, the standard class that you would, you would think of when you shoot three gun. Um, it's defined as like your rifle's allowed to have one magnified optic on it. So you can't have like a, a red dot on top of like an ACOG or you can't have like a, a sideways, uh, like a 30 degree cant red dot, but you can have a magnified scope, like a one to six or a one to eight. And, uh, you can have like, you can have irons on the side if you want, but you can't have a, a uh, anything with glass in it. Basically the, uh, the pistols rules are much the same as like the tack irons division. That's non three gun nation. So it's a pistol, no comp, no optic. Uh, you can pretty much do whatever trigger mods you want to do. It can be any weight. There's no real, real worries there. You can put whatever mag walls you want on it, but uh, no comp, no optic, and the magazine has to be 141 millimeters or shorter. And the uh, the shotgun's much the same as irons, like we talked about before. No comp, no optic. Outside of that, you can uh, pretty much do whatever you want. Yeah, and and in most matches, you know, outside of a uh, uh, three gun nation rules, the the difference is the optic on the on the rifle. That's the only yeah, difference. Between- yeah, attack irons, attack optics, uh, many, many times is the exact same class. It's just that in optics, the rifle has a magnified optic. Something else that we should mention, too, is the, the standard classes, heavy irons and optics. The shotgun has to be a tubular magazine, so you can't use, like, a Saiga. Using anything like a Saiga is going to bump you up a class. 
That's uh that's a very good point. And those uh box magazine shotguns are getting uh super popular, especially with like the dudes at Dissonant Arms and the stuff that they're doing. So that'll bump you into open or uh Three Nation Rules calls it unlimited. And uh and there it kind of gets a lot it gets to be a lot of fun and then maybe a little bit more expensive when you're buying dots and stuff like that. But the uh so what are those? Like the uh the shotgun you can do box box magazine you can have compensators you can have red dots or scopes or whatever you want to put on them yeah you can have you have multiples of those if you want you can have two compensators or two optics or yeah. you know whatever you can use a box fed magazine shotgun um i know a lot of people actually that when they first start shooting they shoot open because they have the box magazine shotgun and they do just fine i mean most people their open pistol will have like a dot on it and a comp which a lot of people's pistols don't have but at the local level i don't really know how much it helps um I mean, it's obviously a benefit, but you can go out and have, if you have a side gun and you want to shoot three gun, you can go out and shoot. You're just going to be put in open class, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. No, no. And it'll actually be a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. And the, uh, the open rifle is pretty similar to the tech, tech optics rifle as well. Um, you can have basically any muzzle device you want on there, like for, from size, whereas like tech optics, the, usually it's a one inch by three inch rule in tech optics and tech irons for like how big the compensator can be. Right. In open, you can do whatever you want. And also in open, you're allowed to use uh, like supporting devices like bipods, which are, are banned or barred from the uh, the other standard classes. Yeah, and if if you have a you know match that does a bunch of crazy shooting positions and real far targets, then you can get into weird stuff like bags, like bringing shooting bags with you and everything for your rifle. Yeah, if you uh, ever if you decide to be an open shooter, you better have a truck because you're going to bring like an entire bed full of different accessories to to shoot with. Because every open shooter I see has like as much gear as the next three tech optics guys combined. Yeah. I don't think open shooters are allowed to fly. Like they always miss the, uh, the weight mark right? because they got so yeah, much, they crap. Too much stuff. <laughs> they got like 60 pounds and just in bipods. Yeah. Different size bipods for different occasions. Exactly. Well, and, uh, I, if, uh, if I missed it, uh, I apologize. But then one of the cooler things about the, uh, the open division on the rifle is the offset red dot that a lot of people do. Yeah, so I, I use like offset irons because I typically shoot tech, tech optics. So mm-hmm. I have like an iron sight. So if I'm if I'm using my scope and it's on like three power and there's some suddenly like real close papers, I can just cant the rifle 30 degrees uh, counterclockwise from my my view and uh, use the side irons. And uh, I mean, you still have to line the irons up, and they they might not be the the best for for longer range. I mean, it's the same same drawbacks that normal irons would have. But uh, in open, you can have a, a red dot mounted there instead, so you got the glass with the, with a dot, and you just can it over and it's like going from one power to three power, one power to six power instantly. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. Uh, I got to play around with that, um, in practice a little bit for a couple matches I did where they had one division for ARs and it was open. And, uh, that was actually a lot of fun. Yeah. The offset red dot is, is awesome. Like I, I love the offset irons as it is. So when you put a red dot there, I mean, it's just, it's just great. Yeah. It makes it super easy, super fast. Just put that dot on stuff and click away. Yeah, I mean, open, like I was saying before, you can be brand new and shoot open, and you can play with all your toys. Like, if you have some goofy gun you made, like, a lot, I see a lot of guys have, like, Glocks with, like, an under frame mount that goes up over the slide. They use, like, an optic on it, like a T1 or something. Yeah. And uh, it's just goofy, but it doesn't matter. Like, you can go ahead and use it. Just just shoot what you got, pretty much. They'll find a class for you. Absolutely. Well, so, uh, anything that uh, that we want to cover on gear here? Uh, not anything else I can think of at the moment. Yeah, I think that pretty much nails it. All right, so we uh, we talked about uh, getting to the match, the mental hurdle of getting to that first match. We talked about shooting the match, etiquette on, on resetting, safety issues, things like that, range commands, and uh, and now we've covered gear. Matt, what else we got? Um, Not much. I mean, the only thing I would say, if, if you're a new shooter, and you're, I mean, it doesn't matter what area you're in, but there's usually going to be some kind of like local community. We're talking about earlier in the, the broadcast here. We're talking about like uh, Trigicon is big in Michigan. Phoenix Ammunition is big in Michigan. Like those are, those are our key players in that, that sport. And they really help out like the local match for us. So, I mean, when it comes time to look for gear, like after you're kind of figuring out what you want to do, there's no reason not to look at the sponsors that support your local area. So, I mean, I'm not necessarily saying to look at my sponsors for my area or my match, mm-hmm. but uh, I mean, if you're from like, you know, the West side and there's MGM targets. I mean, you want to buy some targets. There's no reason not to look at what's local. You might be able to get some kind of deal on it. You might be able to do a pickup or a local pickup. Um, and typically the people that are supporting like the, the three gun sports in general, 
I mean, they make awesome gear. They make really good gear for the sport, and a lot of times that they are shooters. So there's no reason to look at them first over um, other people. But really, all these sponsors help help these products, or all these sponsors help these matches happen, and like the bigger matches and the prize table matches. And uh, just wherever you're from, Minnesota, JP, you know, it it doesn't matter. Just look at who's local to you, and uh, purchase those products if you can. Don't you don't have to do this, but Always be cognizant of who the sponsors are for your local events and try to support those companies. Yeah, and these uh, these folks that are building products specifically for three gun, like there's there's a pa- a passion behind it. It's not it's not the most lucrative business out there, right? They could yeah. be <laughs> they could make a whole lot of money elsewhere, but there's a lot of passion behind it, right? And yeah, that's. And they're also advancing the technology, which is comes up with cool new stuff for us to play with. Yeah, for sure. A hundred percent. They, uh, I mean, we're, we're a real small community. It's real tight knit. Like I said, as soon as you start meeting people at like your first match or your second match, I mean, you're going to see those people at matches that are at different venues as well. Like there's a lot of bleed over between local matches and uh, eventually you're probably going to know like everybody in the area. And maybe after that, you might know everybody like in the, in the state or like in the tri-state area. And it's going to go for the uh, the businesses as well. You'll probably meet a lot of people that run those businesses. And uh, you'll see a lot of that gear popping up often. So, I mean, it's just part of being part of the community, really. Absolutely. I think that's a good point to touch on. And uh, and I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. So, you know, um, I'm going to throw this out there. If, uh, if anyone has any questions on stuff in the uh, Colorado area or anything for that matter, because I've, I've been – uh, fortunate enough to shoot all over the United States, just hit me up, david 3 gunshowcom I'll be happy to help you out if you have any questions or anything like that. Um, also, if you see this uh, this post for this show, you know, put a comment on the Facebook or on Instagram or something like that, and uh, Matt and I can, can answer your questions. We'd be happy to do so. Yeah, and at this point, me and Dave, uh, we know a lot of people in the areas of, in all the states. I mean, between the two of us, we could probably find somebody in your state or local to you that that can you can hook up with to, to go to a local match. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, that's a great point because you know if you uh, if you're like, hey, I'm in Missouri, but you know I don't I don't know where to shoot, and I wish there was a match here. It's like I know three guys that run matches in Missouri, really good ones, and I, I would be happy to introduce them to you. Yep, hundred percent. Yeah. So Matt, man, this has been a lot of fun, dude. I really appreciate you uh, you tackling this topic with me and you're like the uh the perfect guy to do it because uh i know for a fact i know personally because i've been contacted so many times by people that you've helped through the sport how much you uh you give back and uh i totally appreciate you man yeah no problem man anytime all right so any uh any last uh words before i close her out here no i mean if you're if you're a new shooter just get out there and get it done and uh from that point branch out find new people, find new matches. If you want to, if like I tell people, like there's some people that treat shooting like bowling. Like I treat bowling when I go to it. I just want to throw the ball as hard as I can down the lane and smash the pins. <laughs> I'm not there to be competitive. I'm there to have a good time with my buddies like once a month, right? There's a lot of people that treat three gun like that. If that's how you want to be, then go out there and have a good time once a month. If you want to get more competitive, then uh, there's always venues for that as well. There's ways to increase your skill set. And uh, there's no better way to increase it than just going to matches and finding finding holes or flaws in your skills that you can work on in practice. Yeah, that's a great point, Matt. And there's there's room for everyone, right? You know, I know I know several people that shoot uh, one or two club matches a year, and that's enough for them, and they're happy. You know, they they go out with the gear they have, they shoot, they have fun, and then they're done. Yep, I'd say like twenty percent, or maybe like forty percent of every match that we have is like almost like unique names. Like they come out to like one or two matches a year, but they're not at every match. And then like uh, there's always our, our core people, you know, they're there for every single match. But there's a lot of people, they just kind of come and go. Like if they have a free weekend, they might come out with their buddy and shoot the match or they might bring someone out with them. And uh, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to necessarily be like the most competitive person in the world to come out and shoot three gun. That's true. Just be a good person and uh, tr- a three gun will treat you right. Yeah. And reset the targets. <laughs> yeah. Did we cover that one enough? Reset targets. You set the targets. Yep. All right, Matt. Thank you so much, man, for being on the Three Gun Show again. Totally appreciate you. I appreciate you uh, spending your uh, your evening with me here. And uh, as always, man, I'll see you. I'll see you on the range soon. Yeah, I'll see you around, man. Hey, before you take off, check out the show notes at threegunshow.com for links to two things that we discussed in the podcast. You can also sign up on Patreon as a Three Gun Show supporter or purchase uh, Three Gun Show apparel. And I was serious about that uh, in the uh, interview there. If you have any questions or anything, you can email me, dave at threegunshow.com, 
uh, post on the Facebook post or the Instagram post and uh, uh, with any questions about 3Gun and I will uh, we'll try to help you get in the right direction. And I encourage you to go out and, and shoot a match. It's a ton of fun. It's a great community and you will not be disappointed. This podcast is also brought to you by LAG Tactical. I've been using LAG mag pouches and holsters for years, ever since uh, James Casanova introduced me to their Nova holsters and their first generation competition mag pouches. They have a new design for mag pouches out now in the MCS, the modular carry system, which features a two piece design and fits a wide variety of pistol mags, as well as different brands of AR mags. I got to see the prototypes in action when Scott Green won the Lucas Oil PCC championship I'm excited to run them myself. Check them out at lagtactical.com. Quick reminder that if you enjoyed this episode of the podcast, subscribe in iTunes, Google Play, Podcast Addict, or wherever you get your podcast content, so you will always get the very latest. Thank you so much for downloading, listening, and subscribing to the show. I'm Dave Hartman, and I'll see you on the range. Unload show clear.